I was devastated. I felt alone and ashamed. A mom loses five babies to miscarriage. I wonder what you would look like. What would our family be like? See how writing letters helped her heal. I know you are in paradise. I know God cares for you better than I ever could. Plus, former network TV host Cynthia Garrett talks about her journey as a prodigal daughter. All that and more on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. A video of an epic dance-off is going viral after it was shared on Facebook, showing that you're never too old to dance or get into the Christmas spirit. Well, Christopher Tate learned that firsthand when an elderly woman in a nursing home where he was visiting on Christmas Eve started to bust out some moves. Christopher was dressed as Santa Claus and was handing out gifts he had collected when he met a 90-year-old woman who was full of life. Take a look at this. That was a dance your hat off moment. Christopher has been visiting nursing homes around Christmas for years and is happy that the video is going viral with over 10 million views. He loves that it's encouraging others to visit and care for seniors. Mm -hmm. And that's a wonderful thing to do, right. not just during Christmas. <laughs> it really is. She, I was getting a little nervous. She was getting ready to let go of that walker. <laughs> <laughs> go, Don't do it. <laughs> well, speaking of viral videos with Santa, Santa Claus bowed his head and delivered a prayer in the middle of a Bass Pro Shop asking the great physician to heal a little girl's cousin. Here's a clip. Well, Taylor could have asked Santa for just about anything, but asked for her cousin Ashley, who has leukemia, to be healed. That video has gone viral with over 8.2 million views. Struck a chord yeah. with a lot of people. Yeah. All I want for Christmas is my cousin to be yeah. healed. That's Boy, that's thing. precious, isn't it? Well, every now and then, someone in the public eye does something kind by committing their resources and their influence to help others. Carolina Panthers linebacker Thomas Davis recently donated $15,000 to buy 60 championship rings for Harding University High School's football team after hearing that the school couldn't afford to buy the rings. Despite financial hardship, the team has had a winning 14-1 season sending the school to its first state championship since wow. 1953. <laughs> the players were ecstatic to hear that they would each receive a ring, and what a wonderful thing to do. That's um, ring-worthy. That's, that that's a give back. <laughs> well, it really is. That's wonderful. Another athlete is giving back in a big way. Major League Baseball star pitcher Cole Hamels and his wife are giving away their $9.75 million mansion to a Christian camp for children with special needs and chronic illness. Camp Barnabas doesn't just serve kids with special needs, but also serves campers, siblings, parents, and missionaries. The 32,000 square foot mansion is on Table Rock Lake in Branson, Missouri, and has more than 100 acres of land. The Hamels said they felt called to help and to donate. And wow, that's a <laughs> gift beyond measure. That's a big house and 100 acres to go along with it. Absolutely. Uh, keep in mind that we don't get to keep anything here. And, <laughs> and what a way to give forward uh, to say, okay, I'm going to give Absolutely. away a mansion. Uh, yeah, lay up your treasure in heaven. Well, the Philadelphia Eagles, they've been on the, the primary NFL team making headlines for their displays of Christianity but it seems the Dallas Cowboys are following suit with their own recent public professions of faith. Take a look.
2 Corinthians 5, 17, it just says that uh, therefore those who are in Christ are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And like I said in the prayer, baptism is just an external expression about an internal reality. Baptize you, sir, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's get it done. The Cowboys team chaplain shared this video on Facebook of him baptizing linebackers Justin March Lillard and Anthony Hitchens, along with safety Kayvon Frazier. All three players proudly confessed their faith in front of their teammates who cheered them along from the sides of the team's rehabilitation pool. Boy, there's some, <laughs> there's some symbol for the there, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, just for injuries, but also for baptism. That's wonderful. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Wonderful to see. Go Cowboys. <laughs> well, coming up, one mom loses five babies to miscarriage. I felt abandoned and I felt guilt, wondering if I had done something wrong to lose you and fear that I would never have a child of my own. See how she found healing writing letters when we come back. Well, over the span of 15 years, Michelle Dworsky struggled with a deep sense of loss, anger, and grief after losing five children to miscarriage. Michelle never imagined that she would find healing through writing. To my five children in heaven, many years have passed since I lost you, but sometimes it feels like only yesterday. As I sit here, I can remember the excitement of each pregnancy, thinking of the hope that might be and the child that might be, and then the depth of loss when there was no heartbeat on the screen, and the pain that came with losing each one of you and having to say goodbye to the hope and the promise that was there. In those early years when I had lost three of you, one after another, I was devastated. I felt alone and ashamed. God was against me because he let other women have babies so easily. I felt abandoned by him and I felt guilt wondering if I had done something wrong to lose you and fear that I would never have a child of my own. <laughs> baby shower after baby shower, I smiled, all the while feeling like I was dying inside. Since no one had seen you, the loss was not real to them. But to me, you were and are still so oh, very no. real. Oh, no. <laughs> you are my children, and even though we never met, I have named each one of you. During those painful years, God gave me a scripture Jeremiah 29:11 For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you a hope and a future Good job Oh it was so good Sometimes my anger was directed at him and I would shake my fist at him and I would yell at him because he had taken what I loved so much But he spoke gently to me, and he promised me hope no matter what I was going through. 
Eventually, I had your two brothers, during which time I also lost two more of you. It was a season of joy mixed with sadness. My pregnancies were high risk and filled with tests, ultrasounds, and hormone injections. I longed to have a normal pregnancy like so many others. But when those two boys were born, it was pure joy. I cannot adequately express how much joy your brothers have brought to me and your dad. When they were young, I loved just holding them and looking at them in their eyes and touching them and smelling them. I had longed for a baby for so long. And then as they got older, to watch them jump and play, to cheer for them on the sidelines, to watch one of them get married. It was a miracle that I never thought would happen to me. They are amazing men, and I thank God every day for his faithfulness. Having two children on earth eases the pain of losing you, but it does not remove it. I was able to find out the last one of you I lost was a girl. I named you Abigail Rose. Is everybody ready? Yeah. Yeah. Happy I wonder what you would look like. What would our family be like? Would you be tall like your brothers? Would we be friends? Would you roll your eyes at me? Would you have long hair? <laughs> what hopes and dreams would you have for your future? What do you think? I think you look perfect. You just have to say that because you're my mom. No, I was saying Sometimes the pain hits me out of the blue. Like the other day at the checkout line of the store, I saw a mother with her daughter. It looked like they had been shopping for school clothes and they were laughing and smiling and had little jokes that I knew that were just between them. Just like all those years ago, I smiled. But when I left the store, I went to my car and cried for my Abigail. And I cried for all of you. Once again in my sadness, God was there with me in the car. I could feel his presence comforting me, collecting my tears, promising me hope. Sometimes I feel selfish. I know you are in paradise. I know God cares for you better than I ever could. You never experienced pain. You were never sick. You never cried or had your heart broken. But still I miss what could have been and wish you were all here with our family on the earth. Someday I will see you. I will meet you, my beautiful children, for the first time. There will be no more tears. God promises me that when he says in Revelation 21.4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And one thing I have learned is he is faithful to his promises. <laughs> Until then, I love you, Mom. What a beautiful letter a letter written forward to say, one day I'm going to meet you in heaven. Realize that we may not know the reason, and so often we are filled with the question of why. Why do these bad things happen to good people? Why, why do miscarriages happen? Why do children die? Why? Why do these things happen? But realize this, 
God the Father knows what it's like to lose a child. And he watched as his son, his only begotten son, was crucified. And through all of that, he knew that there, there would be a day of resurrection. And in that day, yes, all the tears would be wiped away. There would be no more grieving. And we look forward to that day, a day where there's a new heaven and a new earth. But right now, let's just stop down. Let's pray for people who have lost children. And let's also pray for couples who are struggling to give birth. And whether that's through uh, miscarriage or infertility, let's pray that they would have the power to give life, satisfying the longing of their souls to raise up another generation, fulfill the commandment, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Let's do that right now. Lord, we lift those who are grieving. We lift those who have lost, whether it's a child or a loved one, we just know that you will be for them the God of all comfort. And so come to them now and comfort them in their time of grief. And Lord, I ask that they too would have a vision of the future when every tear will be wiped away, where there will be joy and peace in you. And now for the couples who are suffering with infertility, we just ask that you would give them the power to give life as they cry out to you, as Hannah cried out to you at the door place, the door to the temple as she cried out for a son. Give them the answer to their prayers. Give them the power to have children, to be fruitful and to multiply. And Lord, we also pray for the orphaned, those who are alone in this world. And we would ask that you would place them in families. We ask that you would place them in care. We ask that you would send people after your own heart to watch over them and to raise them up in the knowledge of you and provide for their every need. Lord God, do all of these things. And we come boldly to your throne of grace, for we know that you hear our prayer. We know your heart, and we know that you hear. So do it, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you need prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us, and we believe in prevailing prayer. That's the prayer that gets an answer. That's the reason Jesus gave us prayer parables to show us that we should always pray and faint not. So if you need prayer, we're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, if you'd like to share that story with someone that may need to see it or may need more prayer, you can go to our Facebook page. The story is pinned to the top of our page, and we have people there to pray for you right now. Still ahead, she's been featured on ABC, NBC, and VH1. International TV host Cynthia Garrett shares her journey home as a prodigal daughter. You don't want to miss it. She's here live right after this. Cynthia Garrett is the host of TBN UK's The London Sessions. She calls it a walk show, not a talk show, and says we can't break free from the lies of the enemy until we're walking into the truth of God's love, especially since that truth can set us free. As a little girl, Cynthia Garrett had dreams of being on TV, but she was sexually abused at the age of nine, which left her broken and numb for many years. In her book, Prodigal Daughter, Cynthia shares how she experienced true freedom from her past and how God opened doors for her career in television. Super excited. Cynthia Garrett joins us now, and thank you for being here. Your Welcome. book is called Prodigal Daughter, and you know, we're going to get to that part, but one of the things that really lent your life to that direction was something that happened to you as a child. You were molested multiple times, repeatedly. Yeah. How did that impact you and how did you cope with it as a child? 
Well, I think, you know, sex, childhood sexual abuse is, is, we cope with it as kids, I think, by shoving down the pain mm -hmm. and the, the emotions of it, you know, uh, that the brokenness that occurs, you know, all those different emotional parts that, honestly, they come back to try to control your life. You know? Definitely. Again and so. again and again until you figure out how to be set free. And that's what your book is really all about. Mm -hmm. You know, you had rough beginnings. You, you had the abuse as a child. Your parents divorced, which is also very devastating to children. Really tough. I adored my father and my mom. So my home breaking up was a lot of people, I think, discount how yeah. damaging divorce because is. Because we don't want to think about it. No, you know? especially <laughs> in the world of baby mamas yes. and daddies that we live yeah. in, and everyone's so cavalier yeah. about the family unit. Yes, exactly. And and then you go on to get a law degree. So, I mean, all these things, as powerfully as they impacted your soul, didn't stop your drive to move forward. Yeah, I became, you know, I read an article that said that there are two kinds of uh, abuse survivors. Um, they become different personality types. I became one of those classic types, classic overachiever, mm -hmm. uh, driven for success. And I honestly was driven to find my identity in success. So from the time I was a little girl, I would say, I want to have my own TV shows like Barbara Walters. I want to live a celebrity life. And I want to go to law school so that everyone knows I'm smart. And you did all of that. But <laughs> but then there's a, where what happened that this self-sufficient, self-believing, very motivated, highly gifted woman marries somebody who is an abusive controller, manipulator. Yeah, because I think at the end of the day, I was still chained to my childhood abuse issues, mm -hmm. severely low self-esteem, overachiever on the outside. On the inside, I felt unlovable. I felt, uh, I felt like God had forgotten me. Yeah. You know, I felt like sometimes I think I was actually angry with God, even though I believed in him right. and loved him. I felt like, well, why did you let these things happen to me? What's where wrong with you? me? Yes. Right. Where were you? So I think on a lot of levels, I was so driven to be successful, to prove that I was worth something because on the inside, I just didn't have any real ability to understand my own identity, mm -hmm. and it was really lost. <laughs> it was such a, um, prodigal daughter was such an eye-opener and a reminder, I guess, more than an eye-opener to me, to not ever judge a book by its cover, because if you had seen you if, as an outsider, if I had looked at you at that time in my life, I never would have known this was all going on inside of you. You know what, Terry, it's amazing you said that. I just literally said to someone earlier, I said, I have learned in my journey never to look at someone whose life looks like a mess and judge them because I know that there are people who looked at me 15 years ago on television, on red carpets, dressed probably completely inappropriately and, you know, saying I was a Christian, yeah. but living a totally unsurrendered Christian life. They would have never looked at me and said, God's going to have that girl on pulpits around the world mm -hmm. preaching the gospel and she's going to be a voice in the body of Christ. No, she's going to be in faith-based media. No one would have ever thought that. You know, one of the things you address in your book that you do so well is tackling the issue, which I think is so prevalent in our day. You know, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. But when it comes to physical relationships in the church, I'm not talking about the world, but in the church, mm -hmm. we walk with one camp in the Jesus side and yep. one foot in the world side, and we... We live like it's okay. Why do we do that? I think at the end of the day, we, especially in the Western church, yes. we still want to be our own gods. Mm -hmm. We're still allowing our flesh yeah. to be satisfied first. And we don't understand what it means to be servants because nobody wants to be a servant. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's like the whole phenomenon. I meet all these young men and women of God who feel called to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Well, why Hollywood? Yeah. Who's called to the homeless people? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Know? Yeah. Who's called to the poor? Yes. Who's, you know, it's just, it's, it, it's, we're, we're sort of obsessed. You know, we've got a celebrity spirit that's actually a part of the church. Yeah, just enough Jesus to stay out of hell, but not enough to change our lives. Right. Wow. And then we get mad at him when he doesn't answer our prayers. Yeah. Well, how do we walk in abundance if we don't change our lives abundantly? Mm -hmm. And I, I 
letting him do that is really what your book is all about. It's your journey from woundedness and independence and guardedness and self-sufficiency to daughter of the king. And that's that's quite a quite a process, as we all know. What would your message today for those who are with us to prodigals be? Oh, my God. Isaiah 61. Only Jesus can bind up the brokenhearted and set the captives free. And that captivity is often our own emotional captivity to the issues that haunt us, our fear issues, our sadness, our depression, mm -hmm. you know, our, our fear of rejection and abandonment. Those are the issues that control us that we need freedom from. And he's so tender and so merciful. You can learn more about Cynthia's life and career in her memoir. It's called Prodigal Door Daughter. It's in stores nationwide, and it'll speak to your life if you're struggling with some of these issues. Thank you for being with us. Great thank to have you. you here God today. God bless you. You too. You. And thank you for being with us. We hope you'll join us again next time on 700 Club Interactive. God bless you.